extent to which this is done by um, wind, solar, uh, and, and other variable renewable energy such as geothermal, um, tidal, and and dams is is unclear. So you know you'll be aware recently of quite a lot of controversy between uh, different teams at Stanford. Uh, Stanford and um, uh, Colorado, where one group of academics was claiming that a 100% uh, variable renewable energy system was achievable, and, and that this is being challenged, and it, 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 that has filtered into lots of rather confused press. And without going into the rights and wrongs of that sort of a debate, uh, what the existence of the debate reveals is that there is a time of change um, coming. Now, conventional nuclear power will play, I think, quite an important role in that, but it, it, it has limits. And its limits are that no real way of making it wholly cost effective has been found, and it primarily produces electric power rather than heat. So we say that advanced reactors will play an important role in trying to meet this, uh, this reordering of the energy market, and that this um, role will be driven by, um, uh, by zero carbon um, uh, profile, by convenience, um, uh, 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 and by cost. And again, this is part of a, 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 a vector where some very um, influential people are really urging policymakers to take a, another look at nuclear and um, end the uh, practical moratorium. Um, on nuclear new build that has been in place in in in, in the traditional nuclear uh, nations, and indeed think again about the consensus among certain parts of the uh, environmental movement. I, I, I don't, maybe consensus is too strong a word, but the um, uh, caucus that is actively anti-nuclear. So there are voices and there are relevant voices that are supporting this new look at, at advanced nuclear, and this is resulting in an ecosystem of advanced reactor companies, which includes us. So our reactor is called the Integral Molten Salt Reactor. It's a liquid-fueled reactor system, which is fundamentally different from the solid fuel reactor systems that have been primarily exploited in the past. The um, technology ran um, successfully for four years. Two molten salt reactors um, were, were built at Oak Ridge. There was the aircraft reactor experiment and the molten salt reactor experiment, and there's a uh, a great deal of data on the operation of such reactors. Um, we have, as a company, been able to uh, recruit a degree of support from two sovereigns to date. Um, the Canadian government has allocated us money from a program which is run under the auspices of the Sustainable Development Technology Canada program. And I think that's very interesting because that goes along with the um, uh, matters I was alluding to earlier, which is that people in the um, sustainability movement are thinking more about nuclear. I think, uh, I, I, I don't um, say this with absolute certainty, but I think it is pretty likely that we're the only fission um, uh, nuclear technology company to have um, uh, got money from this very important federal grant program in Canada. And so again, 
as a part of trying to shift the narrative from um, the quite popular amongst certain parts of the policy environment, 100% renewables to um, a, a zero carbon uh, construction, which includes nuclear, is actually getting some traction when somebody like SDTC uh, is awarding money to programs like ours. We, we've also had um, support in the US, both in the form of grants under the GAIN program, which is a US Department of Energy program which seeks to open to commercial companies the resources of US uh, national laboratories. And uh, we're the um, first and only advanced reactor which has been invited to participate in the Department of Energy Loan Guarantee Program, and I'll go into that a little bit later, but that's for a billion dollars worth of loan guarantees to build one at a site in the US, and, and the one that we've gone public with is um, Idaho National Laboratories. Um, we, um, a, a, as a company, have uh, well, are prosecuting the patent portfolio on the innovations embodied in the IMSR, and that's a, a part of our um, uh, IP right uh, portfolio, IP rights portfolio that we're in the process of um, developing, and we're doing that across, um, I, I think, 59 countries. So we're um, seeking to get uh, uh, the coverage that is needed to effectively um, uh, give investors the confidence to invest in something with a degree of IP ring fence around it. Now, this brings us on to our primary commercial claim which is that we're a low cost clean energy alternative to fossil fuels, which can be deployed in the, um, in, in, in the late 2020s. So we'll go a little bit more into that. And in terms of our role and where we sit, we're a vendor of an advanced reactor, which is a, a well-known um, uh, construction. We're, we're not primarily an operator. We're um, developing relationships with operators um, and uh, we've been going um, four years now we think it's a 30 trillion dollar opportunity uh, we, we believe that we have a, a lead market position in the advanced reactor sector um, the data points that we believe uh, support that assertion are that we're the first advanced reactor entering the nuclear regulatory process with the vendor design review phase one with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Um, that process is, is approaching um, an end in September, October. So um, obviously we can't prejudge what the regulator will say about our submissions, but uh, we, 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 we believe that we've put up a good show and established a good um, working relationship with the CNSC. Uh, there are, um, a, a, as we somewhat discussed, uh, strong trends that support um, the commercial assertion that the time is right now for um, advanced reactor Gen 4 technology to be um, I explored in more than a cursory research way, but in a, a let, let's get this to market way. Um, we are um, uh, getting a number of grants and um, so uh, both in you know again primarily in North America uh, the, the the sovereign element of support is there but I think probably much more importantly we're also seeking um, and succeeding in establishing uh, strong relationships with North American electric utilities and we are also successful in attracting private investment capital to support the process of pushing the uh, reactor design through the regulatory process and doing the necessary design engineering 
and um, business development work that all has to go hand in hand in order to realize um, the, the technology. So we say that we're um, in the forefront of what is a very exciting sector. Here is a picture of the machine. Um, the machine is a uh, 400 megawatt thermal, 190 megawatts electrical uh, machine, which is graphite moderated with a liquid um, fuel salt, which is d dissolved in a, a, a cooling salt by way of a, a eutectic. Uh, the important issue so far as the regulator is concerned and ensuring that we have the um, or, or, or the evidence base to support the operation of the um, machine in a way that is compatible with regulatory codes is that it, it's a seven-year replaceable core. So the primary components, heat exchangers, uh, the moderator are, are all in one box that isn't opened. You don't have to go in and, and change uh, fuel or, or moderator during the operating lifetime of the uh, of, of what we call the core unit. So the innovations that we have built the IP portfolio around are those which are to make it easy to operate and not to have to prove, for example, that in the in this high temperature and corrosive environment, uh, all, all the componentry and so forth has to last the whole uh, life of plant or be frequently shut down and in a radioactively hot environment have have things effectively uh, maintained. So again, we we believe that we have a, um, a technology that demonstrates inherent safety, um, which we'll go into a little bit later, operational simplicity, and the, the economics stack up. In terms of the, um, uh, the, the board and directors, uh, I think I just probably draw your attention to um, uh, David, who's very much the technological um, father of this particular iteration of um, uh, molten salt technology. Uh, Simon, who has very much driven the business development. But I think, you know, again, more importantly, um, Hugh McDermott, who's former president and CEO of AECL, is our chairman and is, is very active and brings to bear a very um, uh, deep network in the Canadian nuclear industry. Um, and also David Hill, who has had very senior positions at Argonne and, and, and Oak Ridge. And um, again, interestingly, another, like Simon, another Englishman who's become um, U.S. naturalized and has found the um, U.S. to be a more conducive um, place for nuclear innovation than, um, uh, than the U.K. We, we also have a, a, an experienced management team and, and I think that um, uh, in terms of the people doing the engineering uh, who have credibility with the regulatory authorities, uh, experience with um, uh, both the Canadian and US industries. I think we've got a, a, an excellent team with decades of um, operational project management and um, uh, credential nuclear experience. As well as this um, uh, part of the uh, o operational team, we also have support from a, an advisory board of interested individuals who are pretty engaged and active and who cover um, a, a number of 
uh, uh, slices of the world. So from the technical side, now sadly Dick Engel died earlier in June, but he was the chief engineer of the first operating molten salt reactor at, at Oak Ridge and was kind enough to give us his, his insights in the development phase. Um, and again, very helpful to have had um, involved in the um, preconceptual and conceptual stages of design somebody who's done it before in, in, this, um, in this class of technology. Ray Johnson, very enthusiastic about the, the IMSR, former CTO of Lockheed Martin. Uh, Regis Matsu, former CTO of Westinghouse. In the industry sector, um, Jim Reinch, um, former president of Bechtel Nuclear, Fred Buckman, president CEO of, of Shaw Group, again, um, uh, demonstrating that uh, people in the industrial um, uh, area see this as more than a uh, research project. Um, well, and, and indeed see the, see the full commercial potential of the business. Uh, on the regulatory side, um, Jeff Merrifield, um, former NRC commissioner, has been a, a great friend to the company. Christine Whitman, former head of the US EPA, along with the environmental uh, names there, um, I, I think showed that as a company we're seeking to reach out to uh, people who are concerned about sustainability, who are concerned about um, uh, ways of uh, generating heat and power that are uh, different from the, the, the mix that we've had in the past. And also from the financial sector, Bob Litterman, um, pre IPO partner at Goldman Sachs, um, and, and he writes extensively on the issue of stranded assets in the oil and um, uh, oil and gas sector. And uh, I think, again, representative of a gradual shift where people are beginning to um, question whether the industry can remain, whether the energy industry can remain organized exactly as it is, and looking for credible um, deployable alternatives. In terms of the um, industry outreach, and these are really um, prospective future customers, again, we've been um, fortunate enough to achieve a, uh, a, a good response from some of the biggest utilities that currently run um, a, a number of uh, nuclear power plants, so Duke Energy, Energy Northwest, New Brunswick Power, Next Energy, Next Era Energy, OPG, PSEG, Southern, TVA. And again, I think what's interesting here is that um, you know, relationships are you know, clearly at, at, at different stages, and the Next Era Energy only joined this um, board uh, in, in July, for example, and whereas you know we are working actively on um, some of the uh, you know educating them about our technology and uh, looking at project timelines and so on with with a number of these um, entities. And Caterpillar, by the way, you know very interesting company. Uh, we talk a lot in the small modular reactor. Uh, sector about modularization and building things in factories. So you know, people like Caterpillar are quite good at um, building things in factories and uh, in large metal things. And you know, as I say, in terms of conventional nuclear power plants, we're very compact, you know, three and a half by eight, eight, eight meters. So this slide, I think, shows that at chief executive level, at chief nuclear officer level, um, a chief operating officer level, we have the interest of um, uh, some of the biggest uh, potential customers in, in North America. Again, this slide is um, really repeating that, that, that we have um, engagement with some of the uh, senior national laboratories in, in the US and uh, Canada, Argonne, Oak Ridge, Idaho, C uh, CNL, 
Um, we, we've worked with a number of uh, universities, including University of Manchester in, in, in the UK. We talked about the Industrial Advisory Board. Um, last year, we won the Organization of Canadian Nuclear Industries Innovation Award, which I, I think is interesting in the sense that it demonstrates that um, the Canadian nuclear industry as a whole is recognizing that there's uh, that, that there's something happening here and we've been on a lot of panels and given a lot of talks to um, uh, both uh, private and, 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 and public forums um, and you know we, we, we get a certain amount of press as a result of all, all of this um, I, I think the other key uh, point is that we, we mentioned that we're in the CNSC process. We've also submitted to the USNRC um, uh, licensing plans in connection with the um, uh, loan guarantee project. So the NRC is in the process of reconfiguring its rule book to work with uh, advanced reactors and, and, and something other than the traditional uh, pressurized water reactors. It needs use cases in order to do that. Um, we, we hope that we can be helpful to them in being a use case uh, for them and you know we, we, we suspect that the, the NRC um, chaps are taking a, a, a good look at what's happening in uh, over the border in, in Canada and um, uh, you know, seeking to learn lessons because they, they don't want the US to, to, to lose its um, innovative edge in, in nuclear and there's a lot of fear that that, that, that is the case and that the um, uh, current state of the regulatory rule book in, um, uh, in the US has stymied a certain amount of innovation. Again, timeline and uh, again, without going into the specifics of this, I think the importance is that fr from, from raising money to going into regulation, to seeking government support, to getting um, uh, relevant people and companies to engage with us, we have developed over the last couple of years a great deal of momentum and demonstrated ability to execute on the milestones that we have set ourselves. And, and I think that that ability to execute on milestones and to put forward a way of building the company and to, to finance it and to do all the project work with thousands of lines worth of Gantt charts and you know going up to a properly managed uh, organizational structure is is key to achieving the um, you know really very aggressive uh, deployment targets that we have set ourselves so, and we propose to keep on doing that um, again on the um, price we, we think we get down to about fifty dollars per, per per megawatt hour and that that's competitive with uh, what I suppose is the leading cleaner um, fossil fuel um, technology, which is um, combined cycle natural gas. And this um, competitive advantage as compared with uh, nuclear is, is what we have to keep building the case for and substantiating with the iterative um, processes of for, you know, the first stage engineering then of course the production engineering and, and modularization um, and we, we do have to uh, say why we believe we can get the, the, the this favorable cost profile I'll go into that a little bit further in this talk um, I, I think something that, that, that is also um, important is that there is no point in developing a technology unless you have an idea of where you're going to put it. And we've announced um, that we're doing feasibility studies on Chalk River with CNL. Um, we, we're working with INL um, in the context of the loan guarantee program. And privately, we have an additional three sites that are 
underway with their respective owners. So that's getting to the point of, okay, here you say you have a machine that does this, how does it fit into this side with this cooling, with this offtake, etc., etc., etc.? What's the footprint? Blah blah blah. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with um, the molten salt reactor technology, um, uh, we, we we would draw your attention to the fact that um, the reactor designs that have been exploited in the past have been solid fuel reactors. Now, with any reactor, I, I'm a lawyer, not a physicist or an engineer, um, but the clearly there are many combinations of fuel, of moderator, of coolant, of whether you're trying to make your fuel, fuel in, a, in, in a breeder or, or, or burn fuel you've got in, in, in a burner. Um, and this means that there's a, a taxonomy of reactors that, that is possible, the universe of possible reactors. There's a universe of um, reactors that have been developed to commercial or research reactor stage. The commercial reactors, none of them have been uh, liquid-fueled reactors. So that lozenge on the right of this um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a pointer. Uh, no, I'm not sure I do. But the green lozenge on the right on the slide is uh, is where we sit, and it is not a, um, a class of reactor that has been previously um, exploited. Uh, and we would say that the engine for exploring the um, exploitation of this reactor type now is that the market has changed. Conventional reactors looked to get their cost benefit by getting bigger economies of scale. In practice, it, it turned out that there were also diseconomies of scale and that these, um, uh, the, these large reactors with the um, active safety and cooling measures that were required of them um, became difficult and expensive to get to um, the, the right standard. Also, uh, most conventional reactors, and of course there's a bit of an exception for the UK with its fairly high temperature um, gas reactors, but in general the pressurized water reactor has been quite low temperature in the, in the sort of region of 300 degrees C heat, and um, high temperature reactors are uh, desirable in terms of exploring their use in industrial processes. So we say that if you're going to get a different result, you need to um, start looking at a, a different technology choice that um, maybe has different cost characteristics. Now, going on to that, we, we would say that the main determinant of cost is the safety case. And the safety case drives three things, the, the, the cost to develop the reactor, the cost to license the reactor, and the cost to construct the reactor. And that's a very, um, it, what that safety case is, is very much driven by the technology that you choose. Now safety really consists of, of, of three things in, in a nuclear reactor. You, you have to control the fission reaction, make sure it doesn't run away. You have to, um, cool excess heat, and you have to contain the, 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 the fission products and, and, and the physical integrity of the system, both from physical and, and uh, both from uh, solid, li liquid and gas um, uh, products. Now, that expenditure is driven by the technology that you use, and therefore, if you want to get a different cost result, you're going to have to make a different technology choice. So in the case of the liquid reactor um, system of a, of a molten salt reactor, such as the integral molten salt reactor, the IMSR, the, um, uh, possibly the most important of these three, and the, the other two are important, but possibly the most important is the um, ensuring that you get rid of heat in all circumstances. Now, 
a hot reactor, one at 700 degrees C heat, radiates heat um, uh, a, a lot more than something cooler. So it's a sort of uh, log scale function. And in addition, the fact that the, the fuel convects around the chamber means that it gets to where it can radiate that heat away better. And you don't have these massive heat gradients between, constantly between the solid fuel rod and the coolant passing by it. So much more efficient system for cooling. Um, in terms of control, you have a system that as it gets hotter, efficient slows, as, as it gets cooler, I have a note up saying that screen sharing is now paused. Can you see the um, can you see the slide still? I I can still see the slide. Okay, and you can hear me still. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, so um, go, moving on to containment, um, the IMSO operates at one atmosphere. So you, you don't have a system as in a PWR where you've got 160 atmospheres um, uh, charging around um, pipes and, uh, and pumps. And clearly to engineer so that it maintains its integrity, a, a, a one atmosphere system is, is a lot easier. It's, it, you also don't have um, zirconium cladding on, on the fuel rods that can uh, meet water, produce hydrogen, and, and have a Fukushima type um, hydrogen accident. And the, um, uh, the salt itself is, is pretty good at containing the, um, the, the, the fission products. So if you add all of these elements together, the, the different safety case that, uh, uh, that the molten salt reactor has compared with a, a solid fuel reactor, both on the dimensions of, of cooling the reactor, of controlling the fission, and containing the um, fission products, you, you have a less challenging thing to do. A less challenging thing is um, uh, cheaper uh, to do if, um, done, uh, if done efficiently. Now, again, for those of you who are not familiar with the molten salt reactor um, history, um, a, a brief tour that demonstrates that this was done you know, really from the 1950s through to the 1980s at Oak Ridge. Um, it was very successful, very expensive um, uh, research and development program. Um, the clear advantages are um, uh, that, that you have something that we, we describe as walk away safe. I, if everybody um, catches the flu on the um, reactor system, it, it, it fizzles rather than having to be actively controlled on a um, uh, uh, through through a number of uh, uh, physical variables. Um, and as a result of this extensive public expenditure in the past, it's now time for the private sector, um, you know, with a certain amount of government support, but it, it, it's at a stage where it is realistic for um, private investors to get involved and um, help commercialize this technology. And, and as I say, we've, we've, we've found success in uh, making that argument to people who are looking for a commercial return. Um, and again, commercially, the advantages are driven by cost reduction, um, size, modularity, and, 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 and having a, a format for a high heat reactor that's relatively simple to deploy. Um, another um, uh, uh, slide, I, I think what's important here is saying that we're, we're not a reactor system that's operating in a vacuum. We, we have preconcerted precursors both from the, uh, you know, that have demonstrated both the molten salt reactor success and have also demonstrated the <coughs> value of um, integrating components together in a, uh, in a, um, a compact uh, manner. And, and again, the design choices that we have taken 
have generally been geared towards trying to make the regulator's job as easy as possible, given the fact that we're already um, offering novelty with the liquid fuel. So keep away from other areas of novelty. We are a uranium burner um, uh, reactor. We have no online um, reprocessing. We use um, low enriched uranium, uh, less than um, uh, 5%. Um, there is a fuel supply chain for um, low enriched uranium. There is not for thorium. And if you start using anything which is more highly enriched than that, you get into more difficult regulatory um, and uh, proliferation concerns. Um, so in terms of technology readiness, we acknowledge that we're doing something which um, requires specific regulatory attention and thought in the, in the liquid reactor um, uh, nature of the machine, but we try and limit it as much as possible to that, and that and the uh, limited lifetime of the core to uh, um, uh, ease concerns about materials lifetime with um, a, a, over a long period of time is, is key to the philosophy, the pragmatic philosophy of the company in seeking to uh, advance the technology, but um, not be too clever. Um, another picture that demonstrates the practicalities of having a uh, substitutable core. Um, there are two op in, in, in this instance, there are two operating silos A and B. Um, the machine will run in operating silo A for seven years. At the end of that time, that will effectively be switched off. It will sit there. A new core will go into operating silo B. At some point over that seven years cooling point, the um, operating silo A core unit will be put in a, in, a, in an on-site storage silo, and and so and so the cycle progresses. Um, so there is a, uh, a a clear pathway to getting to the sort of sixty-year um, lifetime of the nuclear power plant that you need in order to defray the losses using this. Um, uh, replaceable core unit. It, the, the, other, the other element that is interesting is that because we have a molten salt as a thermal carrier outside taking the heat away from the nuclear island to its point of use, the balance of plant is um, uh, is a uh, can be a separate building up to about 5k away. So, for example, if we have industrial customers, it is um, possible to have them as not nuclear grade. So, a, say a factory facility producing um, uh, hydrogen or, or, or ammonia would not have to be within the nuclear boundary. And um, in terms of making a nuclear um, heat source usable for industrial process. You can't really ask a, a chemical manufacturer to start submitting itself to N-grade um, nuclear industry um, uh, standards. All they want is the heat, and that's all we need to give them. So to sum up, we, we, we think we're um, uh, a lot smaller than, tr than the traditional PWR. Um, CapEx is a lot less. Um, it, it's, it's a low pressure machine, which we, and a higher temperature machine, a more efficient machine. It's very good um, at load following. A, again, taking back to the aircraft reactor experiment, clearly one of the characteristics of power in an aircraft is that it ramps up and down um, very quickly and needs to do so. And I, I think that's an interesting um, uh, demonstration of the fact that the uh, the load following of an MSR can be really um, very quick in a way that um, uh, for, for a PWR it's relatively slow to ramp it up and down. Um, so we, we also think that the, um, 
the high temperature nature of the reactor offers a uh, set of markets um, for us, combined with the small size, offer, offers a, a, a set of markets for us way beyond the traditional power market for um, uh, nuclear. Um, expanding on that, um, you can see in the right hand box there, we, we, we have um, graphics that show um, as well as power generation. You know, we, we, we think that for ammonia production, hydrogen production, um, synthetic fuel production, desalination, um, the process heat produced by the IMSR is, is, is really very, very attractive. Um, and we also believe that we're complementary to um, the, the variable renewable uh, classes of power production in the sense that we can effectively uh, absorb heat from the grid and, and kick it out again later if, if required, because we have a, effectively a vat of um, heat capacity which can be um, used to dump excess production in. There you can see we have some thermal storage buckets on the left hand side that uh, instantiate that um, particular use of the tool. So again in, in terms of actually saying well that's all very well but why would we do it? Well we say why you would do it is that it's going to take uh, half the time to build, um, it's got a wider market and both on the heat and power dimensions, we, we think that we're um, uh, competitive with natural gas and um, cheaper than the, um, uh, the, the, the bulk of conventional nuclear applications. Um, we, we're a relatively small site. Um, we have a, a, a low water requirement. Uh, which opens up the um, range of potential sites in, in deployment a, a great deal more than uh, the, the, the traditional nuclear plant. Um, the usual advantages that are always um, propounded for small modular reactors, um, a smaller absolute bite size to finance, so the balance sheet is more um, uh, appropriate to a private customer than just governments. Um, and uh, again, we believe that by getting both government support and industrial support, we uh, and by um, engaging in a uh, timely and professional way with the regulator, we have demonstrated our um, credibility and uh, ability to um, uh, meet our targets in terms of uh, timing and outcome um, for you know, really being a, a clean energy machine of, of, of the future. And uh, I'd also point out that in, in terms of our business case projections, we, we're rather sitting on the fence as to whether governments are going to succeed in uh, uh, taking real policy measures to um, control greenhouse gas emissions in terms of uh, carbon taxes and, uh, and so on. Um, but our business case and our, our, our profitability is premised on a uh, degree of deployment that is compatible with um, that not happening. We're driven, we're driven by cost. Um, we're, we're, we're not expecting a, uh, a, a sudden disappearance of, uh, of natural gas from um, the order, but we, uh, you know, if policy vectors do go that way, then great, we, we, we deploy more but we're not dependent on, and our business case is not premised upon, um, effective uh, climate change policy. Um, really repeating the point that, you know, all of the, you know, tr traditionally people tend to say that the energy sector is cut into 
the thirds of uh, 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 of power, industrial heat, and and, and transport, and um, by having the the high temperature reactor, um, we we believe we can attack those three um, thirds of the energy basket, and we've done quite a lot of techno economic assessment work with. Um, Idaho on the applicability of this to different markets, and we're, we're getting you know, promising results. You know, for example, the petroleum refining industry oddly looks quite quite a uh, um, a promising area for application. So there are there are areas of application where more or less work needs to be done on linking technologies, um, but you know all of that work is, is is part of our process in terms of ensuring that we do have the market to um, uh, make a, a a business out of the production of the IMSR. So to sum up, um, and uh, thank you for being so patient and um, you, your response, although I can't hear you, so perhaps, perhaps you aren't there. But uh, we, th we think this is an enormous market opportunity. Uh, we think we're a clean energy alternative to fossil fuel combustion. We believe that the technology is proven and our particular industrial application of it has the virtues of um, being the right size to fit the market need and um, the right cost and, and a pragmatic way of going about it. We've assembled a team um, uh, which is broad and deep um, to execute on that, and we're hitting our uh, targets. Um, our network of relationships extends to the um, uh, environmental sector, and we believe that we're instrumental in, not instrumental, but we're very supportive of efforts to um, try and uh, change the um, uh, uh, the profile of perception of um, nuclear by saying, look, um, the advanced reactor uh, companies coming along offer um, uh, advocates in the sustainability space a new opportunity to reassess nuclear technologies. Um, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, the, 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 the Department of Energy is um, engaged with us through, through their financial support programs and their, their, their national lab programs. Um, we, we believe there's an, an excellent case for um, uh, carrying on with this program and uh, intend to do so. Um, uh, and our team, both in the technology and, and, and business sides, is uh, the, the, pretty much the right team to do it. Um, and that's probably all there is for now. Thanks for that. Um, it looks like we have um, quite a, a few questions that have been um, entered into the questions pane. So did you ah, just want to um, start? Let me open that. Yeah. Uh, I can't see any questions. Oh, hold on. Yes, I can. So you can um, you can get that window to pop out. That can make it a bit easier to to okay, read. Okay. Um... I'm struggling. Hold on, I'm, I'm I'm struggling to see more than a line of the questions at a time. They're quite okay. hard to read. Um, so if you go into the where the drop down um, question menu is next to the um, the cross button, there's a little ah. arrow where you can pop it out. Uh, I've got the arrow, but it's not popping it out. Okay. Um, did you want me to read them to you? Let, let, me, let, let me play with this a bit longer and see if I can figure it out.
Oh, there's a lot of questions. Yes, okay. <laughs> that's number one. Then if I go down. Okay, so I've got the first one. Uh, so I'll read out the question. And by the way, when I'm answering these questions, I should preface them with, I, I may um, come up with a lot of, I, I can't really answer that because I, I'm not a, um, a, an engineer or a technology guy. Um, so uh, I, I, to the extent that I duck questions, it's um, really that I, I don't think I can give a, um, a, a proper answer. But again, before I go into these, what I would say is that with the CNSC, it's rather like the generic, uh, with, with the vendor design review process, it, it's rather like the generic design assessment process in the UK, whereby you have a bunch of headings. Um, uh, there are 19 under the VDR that you have to satisfy. You have an approach and a pathway to um, dealing with the points at issue. So whether it's the, the, the safety of the machine or the, um, the management disciplines and procedures and people that you need to um, run the business or the waste streams, um, we, we, we have to have a worked out and um, uh, full uh, pathway to get there. But I, I'm not. I'm not expert in all of our um, submissions on those matters. So I, I say this um, because I'm, I'm looking at the first uh, uh, question, and I suspect that my um, colleagues would be much better at answering it than me. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll go through them anyway. So the first one says. Although replacing the core components as a whole has operational and capex benefits, doesn't this generate a significantly increased amount of non-fuel waste and hence increased opex compared with equivalent capacity conventional plant? Would this not also have increased environmental impact? I think the answer to that is that yes, um, in the life in the 56-year lifetime of, of a plant going through. Um, you know, seven or eight cycles of, of, of core units, um, you're, you're going to have a, a number of core units and their, their fuel to deal with. We're not proposing um, reprocessing. We're, we're proposing a once through um, fuel cycle. Um, whether this is, um, it, I suppose, would this not also have increased environmental impact? I think that's probably a function of, uh, of how you deal with it. If, if you deal with it properly, it, it, it won't. Um, the, the, the other question in that question is, does it have, and the reason I'm hesitating is I can only see one line of the question at a time, increased OPEX. Um, well, a, again, we, we don't think it has increased OPEX on the basis of the economics, well, increased as compared with what, I, I, I don't know. But suffice to say that the economics as a whole, we believe stack up to produce the um, uh, cost results that we um, put out or will do over the nth of a kind um, cycle of, um, of building it. So that's a slightly unsatisfactory answer, but probably the best I can do right now. I'm moving on to the next question. Didn't the Russians have molten salt reactors in their submarines? Have you been able to benefit from their operational experience? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm sorry about that, but I, I don't know if the Russians had molten salt reactors in their submarines. I do know that um, I, I've been asked the question before, wouldn't this be great in boats? Um, and having discussed it with uh, David, I, I can't give you chapter and verse why, but the answer has been no, we, we think it probably wouldn't be great in boats. 
and we don't have any. Um, uh, I, I think we have contact with the research guys in Russia who are interested in, MS, in MSRs, but we, we don't have any um, active research relationships outside of um, the sort of more, more traditional nuclear countries. Well, that's not fair. Russia is a traditional nuclear country. What I mean is um, re really we're working with Western countries rather than Russia or China for that matter. The next question is, do you have any plans for the construction of the IMSR in the UK? Um, I think the answer to that's from, I, I should say the names of these questions as well, uh, the names of these questioners. Um, First one was Gerald Taranto, so thank you, Gerald. Second one was Adrian Brown, who's, who's left. Third one was Ian Gray. Um, well, I'll answer Ian's um, question, although he's he's left the um, uh, he's left the room, as it were. Have you got any plans for construction of the IMSR in the UK? I think the answer to that question is that we're waiting on government to make its mind up. We, we participated along with others in the uh, small modular reactor competition. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, I, I think it's showing some signs of life, but um, it, it's been very unclear whether there's actually any will to do anything at all in that regard. And even more unclear whether there's any interest in um, Gen 4 advanced reactors. So, so far we have found um, the uh, North American jurisdictions to be more um, uh, accepting of uh, nuclear innovation than the UK. Next question is from Mark Vanneren. And it's, does the liquid fuel remain liquid under all conditions, including under startup and shutdown conditions when the temperatures are presumably lower? Um, it, it, it's a chemical salt, so it's a, a combination of a like like salt, uh, although it, it, it isn't salt, a combination of a uranium and a non-metal, uranium tetrafluoride and, and, and a carrier salt, which is proprietary. Um, so, so yes, it, it's solid when it's um, it's solid when it's cold, and um, uh, I, I think what's envisaged is that you have to heat it up to make it liquid um, before it starts circulating and fishing. And obviously, there are lots of operational issues about um, uh, doing that. But um, yes, it's solid when it's cold. The next question is. Have you had any discussions with IEA regulators about nuclear safeguards? Current regimes are all around solid fuel, and even though you plan to use LU, having it in liquid form, would you require a new set of safeguards, wouldn't it? Um, we're having those discussions precisely around nuclear safeguards in the context of the regulatory process. Um, yes, there are. Um, issues such as mass balancing and so on with um, controlling um, the fuel. So yes, you have to address them and, and, and we're addressing that. How close are you to needing input from component manufacturers and solutions houses to refine the circuitry? outside the nuclear um, outside the nuclear island and that's from John that's from John Falk um, I suppose the answer to that question is um, that, that the first thing to do the engineering on is the uh, core unit and and Obviously, that does include the other um, instrumentation and control and um, components and bits and pieces that need to be on the nuclear island. 
Um, what we are doing as a practical matter is as we get to the point that we have to engineer particular elements, we put out, if, if they're not um, part of the core unit, which is our um, uh, domain, if there's something that we want to buy in from outside, then yes, we put out RFPs and, and seek, um, uh, seek quotes and then engage with people in that, um, in, in that way. Now I've got um, Bernat Serrera from CRA Corporate Risk Associates, company involved with probabilistic safety assessments and safety. In the presentation, you've strengthened the safety case cost. What is the cost to submit a safety case to the regulator in Canada? What are your plans for submitting design to the NRC, a performance-based regulator, instead of goal-setting regulator like the Canadian Civil or the British ONR? Um, I, I, I think, I, I'm not sure that, um, I, I can't remember what the, what the CNSC publicize about their costs. Um, I, I do know exactly what it costs, but um, I don't know if I'm, I, I can't go public with what's actually in the contract, um, and, and I, I'm not sure what the CNSC put on their website or, or, or other public materials for their cost. Suffice to say that um, uh, we've been very happy um, with the CNSC process. We've considered it to be realistic and um, it's certainly a long way from the horror stories that I, I, I've heard of in terms of costs in relation to both the NRC and the um, ONR. They charge for time, they seem to be sensible. Canada in the nuclear industry seems to generally have, um, uh, for whatever reason, um, sort of pragmatic approach to charging for things. Um, we don't feel that we're um, uh, given a whole load of extra costs that uh, shouldn't be imposed on us. Obviously, as we go from VDR phase one into the more detailed VDR phase two, those costs will escalate, but <coughs> they seem to be um, uh, much less, as far as I can see, than what people tend to anticipate in um, uh, the UK and the US. Um, I think there was another element to that question. Maybe I'm struggling to find it. I've got another question from Mehdi Ascarie. Hi, Louis. Thank you very much. You've given us a detailed account of the commercial regulator aspect, which is much. Can you please say something about the operational risks and challenges of this reactor? The difference between uranium and thorium based reactors. Also, how long the changeover after seven years of operation will take, i.e., the shutdown period? Can a copy of your presentation be made available, please? Um, we're not using thorium um, for two reasons. One, lack of supply chains to um, you need something which is more highly enriched to um, kick it off. Uh, shutdown period, um, I think in the course of the seven years cooling, you get to do what you need to do in order to satisfy the um, various waste um, protocols. Um, I'm probably not the person to talk about the operational risks and challenges with this react, react concept in, in a way that would make sense to somebody who is um, more informed on the engineering and operational side than I am. Um, so I'd, 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 I'd like to defer on that. Um, but you know, clearly you don't have to change fuel rods, you don't have to go in and change um, uh, graphite. So you know, we, we've tried to make it as easy as um, possible. Um, in regards to um, the presentation being available, um, all of our webinars, um, the recordings and slides um, will be available um, on our website um, following okay. the presentation. Please that you're doing a webinar on this, Louis, Florian, hang on. Uh, 
sorry. My difficulty is caused by just seeing almost less than a line of the question. Uh, ah. I'm just going to have another look at. No, I, I can't. I can't get it opened out. So we've got one from Dan Robertson that says, um, "One of your rivals plans to use zirconium hydride as a moderator to reduce core size. Have you considered this?" Um, I'm I'm sure it's been considered, but that's not the we're, we're doing our design, not um, not a different design, and that would be a very radical change. Uh, again, I, I'm not the person to talk to the reasons why that design decision was made, but I suspect it's to do with the fact that um, the, the graphite moderated um, molten salt reactor concept has been explored in the past, and again that would be another layer of novelty to um, research and regulate. Actually, if you could read the other questions, that would be helpful because I'm, I'm really quite struggling to. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Where were you? Sorry, you. So you read um, out Medi's question, and I think we're towards the end. Um, yes. Anyway, because we've got we've got two from um, Florian Bay um, regarding the the submarines, but um, I think you addressed that earlier. It was just saying yeah. that the Russian submarines were. Um, NAC cooled. Same for the U.S. submarine. Okay. Um, so, so, all right. Um, but yes, um, if, uh, have you already addressed that one? Um, well, yes. Yeah, so, I, I I won't say any more about submarines because I don't know any more about submarines. Okay, that's fine. Well, um, I think we've got all the others then. Um, doesn't look like there's um anything further that that's come through at this point um, I can't see any hands that have been put up either um, actually I do have one other question I can see here from jo Joanna Playwell um, oh, yeah. which, and that is saying um, we're comparing with a standard PWR you haven't built it yet so your cost estimates aren't realistic um, I suppose the answer to this question is um, that we are in the process of taking this through the engineering and regulatory process. We don't think there'd be any reason to do this unless we thought we had a market. We only think there is a market if we're cost efficient. So of course uh, our argument is that we're making assertions based on our information at the moment. Iteratively, as we go through the process and 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 and, and reach final engineering decisions and uh, finish the design and, and and get quotes for the um, bits that we're not producing ourselves and so on, we, we'll obviously tighten up on those um, cost estimates. But we think that um, we 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 think that we're right in our cost estimates or we wouldn't be engaging in the business and, uh, and raising capital and uh, I, and I think the you know, probably the most important tell in, in that arena is that we don't think that the um, private industry players who are um, uh, looking at this technology with us would be interested in doing so if they didn't think that there was a good probability of achieving the um, uh, sorts of cost outcomes that we're doing because they would see no point. Um, so the proof of the pudding, I think, is of course once we, we, we've built a number of them and um, have got the most cost efficient profile for the machine that can be got. To get there, we have to first regulate the machine and um, get the first one built and I think that it is through um, working with the ultimate customers um, who will want to use this that we um, prove our um, commercial assertions. Um, so yes and uh, until it's done it isn't done but um, the fact that our customers are looking closely at it, I think, is a good um, indicator that we're not um, 
uh, unrealistic in our expectations because they wouldn't be wasting the time on it if they thought we were. All right then. Okay, so um, I think we can finish up now. It looks like we've got the sort of numbers dropping off. Probably everyone's going yeah. back to work now. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so, very much. Yeah, thank you so much for um, doing the presentation, and I hope everyone um, enjoyed it. And uh, as I said, the um, slides and recording will be available um, by the end of the day on our website. Um, if you wanted to have another look or um, share it with any of your colleagues. Um, and um, yeah, have a, a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.